Well, it gives me great pleasure now to welcome Professor Paul Keel, a medical physicist and the director of the ImageX Institute at the University of Sydney, to tell us about some rather remarkable research. The Remove the Mask Project, Paul, it, you're aiming to have an alternative technology that allows the head and neck cancer patient to be treated with radiation therapy without have to, uh, having to wear that stiff green mask that I wore that uh, people can see on our screens at the moment. And you're funded by Cancer Australia to do this. Can you just tell us, before we hear from you where you're up to in this research, the, the, the three key technologies you're bringing together with your team to have an alternative to the mask. What are these three technologies and how do they work together? Right. Thank you, Julie. And that, that stiff green mask is really useful because it keeps the patient still and in one place. And so we need to be very careful during radiation therapy of the head and neck because the, the tumour is surrounded by tissues that we really don't want to irradiate. The, our, our spinal cord, our esophagus, our larynx, our salivary glands, our taste buds, all of these things we really want to preserve. And so we, we use the mask to keep the patients safe and in a position. The problem of the mask, as you found, is up to half of patients experience anxiety and distress about being in a mask, bolted onto this treatment table in a room by yourself for between 20 and 40 minutes every day, day after day for up to 30 treatments. Mm. What we need to do to replace this mask is combine three technologies that we've developed. So we've got surface imaging so we can see the surface of the patient and all this complex motion and anatomy just to know, you know, where is the patient now? And the, the surface is a good start. We combine the surface information with x-rays to tell us where is the tumor inside the patient's body that we need to target. The third part of the uh, solution is if we know where the tumor is, then we need to shift the radiation beam to follow that target and make sure that the beam is irradiating just the target and as few of those really critical normal tissues that are sometimes millimeters away from the tumor as possible. So we've got yeah, surface imaging and X-ray imaging to find the target and then the, the beam targeting to really hit the tumor with the radiation. And it's my understanding that this research if successful, will not only mean that a patient can be treated without the mask, but you think there'll be increased accuracy uh, and precision in hitting the tumour and possibly a uh, shorter time on the machine, which will be both good for the patient but also good for the health system. Yes, in, in addition to helping the patient. So this mask that you mentioned is... It's very good when we start treatment. Sometimes for some patients, they may lose weight uh, due to chemotherapy or there may be shrinkage of the target from the radiation therapy. So the, the anatomy is changing on a day-to-day -day basis so that the mask is actually can sometimes be a little bit loose and enable some motion within the mask that is, is very difficult to detect if we're th through the mask. So if we are doing this, real-time imaging and correction and making sure that the beam is always targeted at the cancer, then we hope to improve the tumour control and the chance for tumour to, to improve um, cancer outcomes and to reduce any radiation to these critical normal tissues and improve the quality of life of cancer patients. And if we can achieve that, achieve better outcomes and have better accuracy, what we can then do is really look at, do patients need to come in for 30 daily treatments over six weeks? Or can we actually treat in 25 or 20 treatments? And just meaning that that's one or two weeks that patients aren't coming into the hospital, parking, carer time, possibly hotels, really reduce the, reduce the cost to the health system and to the patient's and improve, really improve the patient experience of head and neck cancer radiotherapy, which is a long, tough journey. Before I ask you about the surface imaging research you're doing, just to get a quick update there, 
because as I understand it, that's where the real innovation is in this. I just want you to explain to our audience that with the uh, other te two technologies, the X-ray imaging and the beam targeting, you've already got runs on the board in other cancer areas, haven't you? Yes. Yeah, so for the, the X-ray imaging, we've treated many prostate cancer patients and liver cancer patients and two Cancer Australia-funded clinical trials. It's really validating that this technology will work in patients. We still need to adapt that to the complexity of the head and neck patients. So there's still further work to do and integration work. The other technology is hitting the target. So when the target moves, that the beam locks onto the target and irradiates the target. We've treated prostate cancer and lung cancer patients with that technology. So we've proven them in other cancer sites. They do need to be adapted to head and neck, but the barrier is less because we've already clinically proven those technologies. And putting them together is a challenge. Where are you up to with the, uh, the surface imaging and when will you be going to some form of clinical trial? With surface imaging, it's exciting that we have uh, ethics approval to run these, uh, to run the studies with our partners at Western Sydney Local Health District. And it's really, um, so we will be observing, initially observing, we won't be affecting the patient's treatment, just monitoring where, how much the motion is. And our surface imaging, we're quite close. We're imaging quite close to the patient to really try and get submillimeter accuracy of the patient's position during treatment. And do you think you'll be able to go to clinical trials where you integrate all three technologies to actually treat a head and neck cancer patient with radiation without the mask within the next 18 months to two years? I mean, what's the, the time frame of getting to clinical trials with this? Our goal would be to be technically ready to treat patients within 24 months and really to be looking at another 12 months to go through the clinical trial development and also the, the quality assurance and safety that is, that is really needed. You know, we're talking high doses of therapeutic radiation and everyone in the team needs to be convinced that this is going to be safe. So we, yes, we want to roll this out as quickly as possible in a safe, in a safe manner. Two years for the development and integration of the technology and another year to just test safety and go through all of the, the documentation and testing that is needed to run a clinical trial. Look, let's come finally then to the all-important team because multidisciplinary cancer team members listening to this are thinking, who's he got working on this to make sure this is safe for the patient? So uh, tell us about the, the, the skill groups you've got together and also why psych psychologists are involved. Yes, it's one of the real benefits and, and joys of working on this research project is that we've got a very diverse, multidisciplinary, engaged team. So we talked about, and you experienced claustrophobia and anxiety during your treatment. So we need to get psycho-oncologists involved. This is not something as a medical physicist that I have any any expertise in. And so they, they bring a very unique perspective on the patient experience and how do we measure that and how do we measure that we've made an improvement. We've got the all-important clinical team, the doctors, the radiation oncologists, the medical physicists and the radiation therapists who are the gatekeepers of the treatment and want to be sure that they're giving the best care to their patients. We've also got engineers to, and software developers because we need to build the product and to really to be building it in engaging with the clinician. So we're not doing this in isolation in a lab. We're building a tool for the doctors and the patients with the doctors and the patients. And I mentioned the patients because we do have people like yourself and others, patients who are very passionate about making improvement improvements for future head and neck cancer patients. So it is a wonderful multidisciplinary team and we're pushing forward as hard as we can.
Well, Professor Paul Kill, thank you for the, for the update. There's obviously action ahead over the next couple of years. I should say uh, this is funded by Cancer Australia, and I think you're going to be uh, going for further funding. Just before I let you go, when I was at one of the meetings where you're briefing uh, me as and the other patients about what's happening, uh, I have heard reference to a person who works in your at the ImageX Institute who used to work firing. Uh, space junk out of space. I don't know if they're involved in the remove the mask, but explain how, why you've got a, a you know a scientist like that working at Image X. Uh, this is yeah, Professor Ricky O'Brien, and a lot of uh, if we're looking at targeting, there's actually a lot of and imaging. There's actually a lot of analogy between astronomy and medical imaging and medical physics. So he's looking at detecting detecting space junk so we need imaging and then you need to hit them with laser targeting so we've got it's a similar problem you've got you've got to find this difficult difficult space junk target and then you've got to use a laser to hit it in cancer for the remove the mass project we need to find where is the tumor inside the body that we can't see from the outside and we need to hit it with a radiation beam so it's actually similar problems in completely different fields, but we can leverage the technology from those other fields to improve cancer treatment. Look, uh, Professor Paul Kill, thank you so much. And I, I know that there'll be patients and family watching this who'll just be so excited that uh, such high tech work is being done to provide an alternative to the mask for those of us who find it, you know, just very a traumatic experience as it is for some. So thank you very much and uh, all the best for World Head and Neck Cancer Day. Thank you. Yes, and a happy Head and Neck Cancer Day. Let's go to a brighter future. Thank you.